As I was saying, whoever controls the high ground of space controls the world. Now, how in the hell did they ever get ahead of us? The Interplanetary Podcast. The exploration of space for the benefit of all humankind. Your hosts here in England. Chris Carney and Matthew Russell. Do-do-do-do-do-do. Oh, oh yeah, yeah baby. baby Johnson. Lyndon Johnson. <laughs> Lyndon B. Johnson. Lyndon B. Johnson. Okay, I will. Bit of a big name in space, really, because often people associate JFK with space. Yeah. But Lin- Lin- Lyndon Johnson's your, really your kind of big space politician from the era, I'd say. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it interesting. was mostly under his watch. Like, Kennedy, you know, right. set the ball rolling, but, you know, he had the selfishness of getting himself perished and couldn't carry it on. <laughs> I've, I've got a feeling that Lyndon B. Johnson was even the person pressuring Kennedy into getting the ball rolling as well. Yeah. But that's another story. It's worth saying the rest of that quote because today we're going to be talking about space war. Oh, yes. Space war. Pew, 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 pew. pew. <laughs> pew. It's a bit of a tricky subject, isn't it? Because let's face it, it's, it's, it's one of the most sort of fantasised thing. In science fiction, isn't it? The old space war. Yeah. But also, it's becoming more and more relevant to us. Also, I've just finished watching For All Mankind, which I thoroughly recommend to anyone. I think it's, I I genuinely think it's the best of all those kind of spacey programs that have come out in the last few years. Mm. It's absolutely brilliant. But the final episode, oh my God. God, it was so good. But the <laughs> I will watch this immediately. Uh, yeah, you should do it. It definitely sort of runs along the theme of what we're going to be talking about today because there's a lot of militarization and and how it all pans out. Obviously it's set in an alternate universe, but clearly it's there to kind of warn us about some of the things that can happen. Yeah, so L- Lyndon Johnson, the part of that, the rest of that quote that goes in between the bits that you said, he says something about the Roman Empire controlled the world because it could Build roads. Later, the British Empire was dominant because they had ships. In the air stage, we were powerful because we had the aeroplane. And now the communists have established a foothold in outer space. Pretty soon, they'll have a damn space platform so they can drop nuclear bombs on us. Like rocks from a highway overpass. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and I think that's that's the nightmare that we're all kind of dreading. And it's, it's the militarization of space. But um, am, am I right in uh, thinking that there is a global agreement about this? About well, th- not doing yes it? And, <laughs> <laughs> well, the kind of, well, they're, they're, I mean, yes, there's the Outer Space Treaty. But clearly, that that doesn't mean anything when it comes to things like inter, in, you know, intercontinental ballistic missiles that are going into space, anti-satellite technology and things like that. It's all out in space, and and so much so that all the sort of major powers now have got space forces as part of their military. So you know, America have got a space force, China have got a space force. Um, Russia have obviously got a space force, and even the UK have got a space command now. Hmm. Whether we like it or not, it kind of already is a battleground. I kind of and thought that the, uh, Russia would have called theirs Sputnik. <laughs> like everything. What should we call our vaccine? <laughs> oh, I know. How about Sputnik? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> and then what, what's the next vaccine going to be called? Vostok. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> what is it about the kind of fantasy of, of war but especially war set in space. I mean, if you think about it, like, think about everything, all the big films of the last few decades. It's like Star Wars, Star Trek, the you know, or everything in the Marvel Universe, Ender's Game, War of the Worlds, Starship Troopers, The Expanse. It's all about war and space, isn't it? Even, even Blade Runner is to a certain extent. Yeah. Can I just say, though, Starship Troopers, what a movie. Oh my god, it's so good. Yeah. It's so good. Superb. It's yeah, it's one of those movies that that if you take on face value, you think it's silly. Yeah. But you scrape away at that sort of surface meaning and you realise, no, this is actually a really deep film. And interestingly, it's actually parodying what you're talking about, that movie. It's a it's a parody of our obsession with 
War in Space as well. well. You know, it's sort of yeah. The original book, isn't it? It's Heinlein, isn't it? The original book, I believe, is actually kind of is the is the first real literary reference to the military complex, mm. isn't it? Mm. That you've got to have this kind of permanent enemy to fight against. And that's what sort of drives your economy and drives purpose and things like that. And I suppose all those films that I mentioned then, the, the, the only good thing about them is that it's they're normally fighting an external enemy, not so something that's against humankind. Like Star Trek is war, you know, all of humans have kind of clubbed together with a bunch of other reasonable aliens to fight terrible aliens or try and avoid fighting terrible aliens. You know, there's a there's a kind of well, I guess it's an American moral, isn't it? In 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 Star Trek. It's very much of its kind of era. Yeah. Yeah. But like if you take any of those things, like the expanse is a lot bleaker. It's almost as it's almost as if they're saying Everything that we said in Star Trek, we can we can clearly see that, that it wouldn't happen like that because people just aren't like Jean Luc Picard. Mm. They're <laughs> they're more like Donald Trump and <laughs> and Vladimir Putin. <laughs> or or those are the people that are more likely to get in charge, I suppose. But maybe that's the problem. Yeah. Do uh, you know what? Can I just add to the list there, the edge of tomorrow? Oh no, Edge of Tomorrow is the the one that's the repeating one, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Where he keeps having to repeat himself. I Groundhog think Day with I think aliens. It's called Edge. It's called something different in different countries. It I think is it's called something. Yeah, something I watched it in, in Norway America. quite recently. I've seen a few times, and I watched it in Norway, and I can't remember what it was called, but it has got different names. It's called yeah. something like yeah, it is called something like Eat, Kill, Repeat, or something. Yes, like that, yeah, it? yeah, something, something re- like that, it's, it's, or, or so, something like Ooh, Tom Cruise is in trouble, <laughs> something like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but there's another one that Tom Cruise did as well, which which Oblivion. Is Oblivion, yeah, because mm. that's again that's that's like humans versus humans, isn't it? Yeah, it kind of very bleak dystopia. But the thing is, it's kind of already here, isn't it? Really, because here's the evidence, right? The first suborbital rocket was used not to launch something into space or for science, but to blow up London. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like it's like it's that's what his, his purpose is to kill people in the Second World War, right? Yeah. And then even the technology of getting into space is born out of war. And then the Russians and the Americans developed their inter intercontinental ballistic missiles before they thought about putting satellites and people on them. So, like, the ICBM was invented before they were then used. I mean, ultimately, Sputnik, Yuri Gagarin, John Glenn, they all went up on missiles, on on things that had been designed to deliver nuclear warheads. <laughs> let's, be, let's be honest, it's the absolutely astronomical, literally astronomical money, uh, amounts of money that were put behind the programmes in the 60s were because of military backing. The, the space race itself to get to the moon was all about exactly what Lyndon Johnson was saying. Whoever controls the high ground of space controls the world. And that, you know, that was the thinking in the, in the late 50s, 60s. It's like we've, we've you know, make, I mean, make no mistake, all those, all those people like John Glenn and, and Neil Armstrong and, and the rest of them, they're, they're military people yeah. thinking, I do think they were thinking on those kind of very broad... You know, civilization style. <laughs> you know, this is this is it. It's our way or their way, and we've and we've got to make it our way. This was existential. Yeah, yeah. It's it's weird. It's it. It's painted as this great adventure. You know, the the the, the Apollo missions. Mm. They they're, they're a great adventure. But I, I I think I talk about PR a lot when I'm a guest on this for some reason. But that was the spin, wasn't it? That was the PR that made everyone go. This is great. And we weren't yeah. really thinking about the sort of darker side to it. There was a very dark side to it, but no, but I, th- I mean, there is a as with everything, it's complicated, isn't it? Mm. But because the all the scientists, the engineers, podcast listeners, hmm. you know, we 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 all probably hate the idea of war in space, and and all the people involved, the people that actually made Apollo happen, all the engineers and 
etc., cetera, etc., cetera, were doing it f- because they wanted to get to space. And even von Braun, I kind of do believe it's because he wanted to get to Mars. Uh, but, you know, unfortunately, he got caught up in the war and and all the hideous things that went with that. Yeah, yeah. He probably could have been a better person, but it's really difficult. I mean, it's really difficult. I mean, I think von Braun's like a really good example of how hard it is to unpick the, the, the sort of morals of it all. Because you look at Von Braun, you think, I just don't know whether to feel sorry for him or think of him as a monster. I just can't work it out. He was a bit of a Nazi. <laughs> well, I mean, he was a Nazi. <laughs> I mean, he actually was a Nazi. But, but, then you think, but then you think he probably had no choice. No. I mean, where was his choice? I mean, you know, a lot of Germans were Nazis, and we can't say that German people are inherently evil. They're clearly not. They're human beings, and every German I've ever met is as nice as any other person I've ever met. Very so, true, so very it's true. Like, I lived with a German at university, so, and uh, he, he moved in, and uh, the rest of us were, were, were British, and we joked, like, you know, don't mention the war type things. And um, <laughs> uh, a few weeks into him staying there, we still hadn't mentioned the war, and then one day... Um, I was uh, I was up in my room and he he shouted upstairs like Chris Chris and I was like what, what what's up mate and he went my dentist is a Nazi <laughs> 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 he just got a letter from home back in the days when you got letters from home and uh, it turns out that his his dentist was actually a, a Nazi <laughs> oh, so after that we were fine to talk about the war. Well, I mean, it's it's so tragic, isn't it? There must be loads of people who are sort of living in that sort of guilty shadow as well, all across Europe, all uh, through any place that's had war. I mean, it's depressing, isn't it? Mm. That kind of stuff. Mm. Mm. I mean, so I mean, the thing is, I mean, it, you'll see in the interview. So, the, but the, the interview that I've got is with a guy called Jeff Jeff Shessel, who is one of, who you, who was Bill Clinton's speechwriter for a while, Brilliant. and. Uh, yeah, wrote actually some of the you know some of Bill Clinton's really important speeches, uh, and he's still obviously a political writer. But he's written quite a few really cool books as well. But he's got a book coming out called Mercury Rising, which is about John Glenn, John Kennedy, and and the new battleground of the Cold War. So it's 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 all about this pivotal moment where John Glenn is, ba- you know. I, I refer to it in the interview as uh, the Champions League final where America are down 2 nil, and you know they 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 just can't they just can't seem to get anywhere near scoring a goal and this is this is John Glenn has an opportunity to to get one back and if they miss this they're out of the game mm. so that's that's how I, that's how I kind of see that that moment it always has in, to come back to Liverpool football club doesn't it <laughs> well, of course, we. I've, I just watched uh, just watched Chelsea beat Man City, which was uh, which was a bit of a shock. Hmm. But uh, there we go. Um, um, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, well, it. I, I. You know, Man City can't win the Champions League, so and I think that America were feeling like that. Yeah, that America just couldn't couldn't get a first in the space race. You know, they just kept getting beaten by by the Russians. You know, the Russians were kicking their ass, <laughs> and it, and it's and you know it was bad. But I mean, the other thing was at this time, of course, not only in space, but they but they were building these intercontinental ballistic missiles. Then the Americans, you know, and, and they've got into this ridiculous situation where they both start building enough nuclear weapons that they can wipe each other out. Uh, and then the Americans start developing ABMs, which are anti-ballistic missiles. I, uh, I used to have an uncle ballistic missile. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Well, this one's an anti, uh, and it was the Ni- the Nike Zeus program, which I think is quite a cool name, isn't it? Weird, isn't it? Yeah. Zeus. It and and the logo is Zeus himself wearing Nike trainers. No. No, it's not. <laughs> you have me for that. a minute. It'd be good if it was. I was like, it's clearly pre Nike, Chris. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Only uh, just though. Only just. Only just. Yeah. Pre-Nike. Uh, uh, yeah. But but the weird thing about these ABMs, of course, you can't just hit one of these intercontinental ballistic missiles because they're going very very fast. Yeah. Right. So you can't just hit them. So what they do is they launch 
a really another nuclear missile that that blows up near it and takes it out, right? Yeah. So that's how these things worked, like blowing up over the North Pole and stuff like that. And all these programs become less and less. Then it just starts this classic arms race where you've got designing nuclear weapons that you can strike with and then designing anti-ballistic missiles that you could try and stop them with, right? Yeah. And because the whole idea is mutually assured destruction, in other words, mad. if you do this, then it's it's the end of... Mad. It's completely mad. It, it is... If you do this, then we do this, and then it's the end of the world, so we won't do it. We, we, we're just agreeing we won't do it. But if you develop your anti-ballistic missiles enough, you can get ahead, and so there isn't mutually assured destruction anymore which is Ugh. which is which is weird isn't it i mean this is got to be one of the weirdest concepts there is that there was a 1972 anti uh, ballistic missile treaty the abm treaty <laughs> that basically stopped people from building too many so that there was still mutually assured destruction <laughs> <laughs> so you were you were only allowed to protect your capital city and your and your launch facilities that was it and you were sort of limited to the amount of abms that you could build i mean doesn't that seem weird it's absolutely insane i mean there's some kind of method to that madness yeah because the thing is it's it's acknowledging that the technology exists it's 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 no one stop it standing down and saying we're going to get rid of ours and it's basically mm. everybody just go look. We've all got to keep these because they exist. <laughs> so let's yeah. let's agree on this. And it, it's just, it's a, a bizarre um, diplomacy, I think. Yeah, it's mutual mutual assured destruction is bizarre dip, dis, diplomacy yeah. to say the least, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> uh, and but and Reagan didn't like it, so Reagan started this thing called Star Wars, yeah, which was basically spending loads of money on trying to get the upper hand, but pretending that it wasn't breaking the ABM treaty. Hmm. And 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 drop off was completely incensed by it, and I love his quote. It is. It is time Washington stopped thinking up on one option after another in search of the best way of unleashing nuclear war in the hope of winning it. To do this is not just irresponsible, it's madness. <laughs> I agree with Andropov. <laughs> well, but it's crazy. The whole thing's crazy. I mean, both sides of the argument are literally mental, aren't they? Yeah. I mean, it's like we've got to have mutually assured destruction. Oh, okay. In other in other words, these nuclear bombs are so ridiculous, we, we can't use them. So we just got to both make sure that we both have them. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, you know, so, so there's this arms race going on, and then the Russians develop these things called multiple independently targetable, targetable reentry vehicles, or MIRVs, right? Mm. And basically that means that they launch one massive rocket and then loads of warheads going off in different directions can then come off that, which means that the US ABMs just become completely impractical because they've got too many targets to actually hit. And so it just becomes impossible. Plus, there's loads of dummy targets and things like that. So you're trying to hit things that aren't even real anymore. And so it kind of just made the tech like ridiculously difficult. And, and as a result the Americans decided to withdraw from the ABM Treaty in 2002. Yeah. Um, and, and one of the reasons was um, that the, the US basically said it was because they didn't want to be blackmailed by a rogue state. Yeah. In other words, it's like what they, they want to build a national missile defence so that they can protect themselves from, from, not from Russia because they're reasonable, but from somewhere like Iran if they were to get uh, uh, you know, intercontinental warheads. Is that North Korea Iraq calling or you know. North Korea? Uh, or hello? North, exactly. Well, North or North Korea, exactly. And so <laughs> that was one of the reasons why they pulled out, or, or apparently so. But there were so many critics saying, "Look, this is this is the end of non-proliferation. You know, this is just going to be a red flag to Putin and saying, right, you go off and build whatever you want now, mm. because the Americans have come out." You might as well go and build whatever you want. Of course, Putin in 2018 announced this avant-garde and loads of other things, but avant-garde is this crazy multiple 
re-entry vehicle, one of these Mervs, but it's but it's can glide in hypersonically to and 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 it can maneuver as well to evade being hit by missiles and things. And it and the test one flew at twenty seven times the speed of sound. <laughs> so that's twen twenty one thousand miles an hour. Wow. So that's three thousand miles an hour faster than orbital speed. And that, so, is, that, know, is, that, is, that, is that in orbit or is it in the atmosphere? Well, that, that's, yeah, no. So it's a ballistic flight and it's as it comes out of space, it's coming back in hmm. and it's got this hypersonic glide capability to sort of go and hit targets. Are we talking like drones being, as well? Well, and, and and of course, drones are part of, of all this proliferation as well. Yeah. You could in some ways... Well, see, this was one of the things that Russia was really worried about, the space shuttle. Because space shuttle, and I guess it's kind of little miniature version, the X, is it the X, whatever it is, the X-37? Mm. What's it called? The little the little baby shuttle. Um, you know, these are, in some ways, they're, yeah, they're drones that can achieve space, you know, get into, getting into space, which, of course, makes them lots more powerful. Um and one of the things that the Soviets were really worried with when the space shuttle was being built was that the space shuttle could dive out of out of orbit and bomb Moscow very very quickly with with no with you know a moment's notice. Hmm. And apparently that was one of the things that motivated motivated them to build Buran was this kind of military aspect of of having this this space plane that could come out of orbit and and drop bombs but there's there's loads of weird stuff from that era where you've got um kinetic bombardment systems there's these things called fobs which were designed by the great Sergei Korolev and he designed this these nuclear weapons that were like kinetic bombardment systems that you sort of fired them up and they were all and they could follow a kind of almost get into orbit and uh, and and they wouldn't reveal their target location because they would then be they would then sort of be brought out of out of orbit back down onto the targets but they would be coming from directions that the americans wouldn't be aware of so they'd be coming over the south pole and so therefore norad wouldn't be picking them up mm. uh, with their early warning systems and just stuff like that pretty much if you look at nasa's budget the military budget is almost identical to the NASA's budget that you see on the on the on, you know on the public side. So you know if if NASA's got a budget budget for things like Perseverance and Artemis, there'll be a military budget doing a sim with a with similar ta price tags on the other side. <laughs> so it's a sort of goes without saying the sort of the the great great te technological progress is born out of necessity which is quite often more well certainly things like yeah modern medicine radar gps i mean there's one huge military spin-off and that's the gps system mm. i mean gps systems really are military systems and that you know so the american gps system you know it's run by the military and you only have access to the full gps system if you are the military and it's like the UK helped build Galileo which is the European GPS system yeah but we're frozen out of the military aspect of it which is weird because we're, we're all part of NATO and stuff like that and you would have thought that the Europeans would realize that the UK were a trustworthy partner so it looks like that you know the UK have to build may have to build our own GPS system for our military which which is one of the reasons why the UK potentially bought one web because there might be a way of piggybacking onto this vast constellation a a military grade gps system oh brexit's gone great isn't it <laughs> well that is definitely i mean <laughs> that is a weird that is definitely a weird one for brexit i mean i don't know i mean in terms of i mean this is the military complex, isn't it? I mean, that in itself may create loads of jobs and may have, you know, may have saved a big company. It's certainly created a rival to Elon Musk in the space internet business. Yeah, we talked and about I this last week, and I agree. Be a, yeah, that's yeah. got to be well, a the one good web thing, thing is fantastic, it? and you know, you 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 sort of spelled it out for me. And the one web thing is, it is a really superb thing for for us and for also for the. You know, for the competitor, 
uh, to stop the monopoly. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, whether it will work or not is is, <laughs> is a completely different is a completely different thing. I mean, that that you know, he, there's there may even be some like really hard things to make Starlink work. I was, I was like looking at things like. Um, the way that people were having to have their uh, receiver dishes and stuff like that, like massively high on their <laughs> roofs and stuff, because any tree in the way is like that's the end of your signal. Yeah, <laughs> but it's you know it's it's they're not you know they're not comp- they're certainly not troublesome free, and there's only so many people can get on them at any one time, and it's going to be mm. it's going to be very interesting to see how these these systems actually pan out. It's just in the a, end. A, a little side note: is it just me or does people? Uh, there seem to be a lot more sightings, a lot more clearer sightings of the of the Starlinks uh, recently. Um, I, ju- mm. I just noticed a lot more people see actually seeing these things because I was going out trying to see them last year when they were promised and it just wasn't happening. <laughs> I was like, I can't see anything. <laughs> but people have been seeing them more. Mm, I mean, there's more of them. Of course, there's three or five thousand of them. Yeah, and then but the weather's clearing up. I think. I think you tend to see them when they've just been launched. Yeah, that's the thing, because they 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 raise their orbits and bec- and and drift apart from one another, so they're right, harder to right. spot. So yeah. I think you see them when they're lower down, and also they are you know apparently orientating themselves to make them less reflective and all those kind of things. So they, you know, they are making an effort to make themselves less of a problem for observers but they you know inevitably they still will be yeah yeah but yeah we'll see i mean i have to say i mean if 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 it was elon musk i wouldn't really trust it but elon, but spacex isn't just elon musk it is a sort of functioning company <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but 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 still there's something not quite right about it is it but satellites are obviously a major concern is is one of the sort of big things about space force and things like that if you think about how much we rely on satellites and of course the russians have been putting weird satellites up that have been tracking american satellites and doing all sorts of funny things what's that space. thing what's that uh, sergey what's that thing on the side of the satellite that looks a bit like a gun <laughs> don't, don't you worry about that <laughs> Oh my god! What do, did you know? Did you know that Salyut three was fitted with a twenty three millimeter cannon? <laughs> did not know that. That is insane. Yeah. <laughs> and oh my god! <laughs> and, and it's likely that Russian cosmonauts regularly ca- carry a triple barreled TP eighty two survival pistol. So it's it's got a, it fires bullets to kill wild animals just in case you're land off course into the in the wilderness, and it can sh- shoot shotgun shells and flares. Do you know what so I'd love if it, if if they just had a fourth one that when you press that a little flag comes out that says bank, except in Russian. <laughs> 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 bang! <laughs> I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to look it up now. What bang is in Russian? <laughs> klopnut. What? Klopnut. Klopnut. It's got klopnut written on it. Do they not have? Do they not have on a butter player over there then? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we love you, Russia. We love you very much. Klopnut. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's great. Klopnut. Uh, that is glory. That's very funny. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you think, Chris? Do you think that war in space is inevitable? I, I do believe it's inevitable because. We only have to look at the history. We don't have to look at what, what Johnson said. Is that the the human race when there when there is a, a, a time of exploration, it inevitably leads to war. So we it's it, it's it, it is inevitable. It's terrifying and inevitable. Oh man, get this! In the late fifties, the U.S. Air Force were looking into the possibility of detonating an atomic bomb on the moon. For a laugh. <laughs> called, called Project A-119. Catchy. To show their superiority to the Soviet Union. 
And they looked at putting a military base on the moon as well, Project Horizon. Hmm. And the Lunex project as well was a 21 airman underground air force base on the moon. So, you know, this stuff has been taken really, really seriously. Yeah. But I think the scariest of all of the space weapons that have ever been up <laughs> is Polyus. Have you ever seen that? No. So, you know, the Buran space shuttle? Yes. One of the things that makes Buran space shuttle really cool is that the, the American space shuttle launched on that big orange tank with the two solid rocket boosters, right? Yeah. Whereas the Buran didn't actually have the engines on board. The, the shuttle itself, the orbiter, it, had, it, it launched on a rocket called Energia, which, which, ha, which was a bit like the orange tank of the space shuttle. But instead of having solid rockets, it had these liquid uh, boosters either side, right? Yeah. Which is something which is something they got wrong in For All Mankind, which I was a little bit disappointed with. Oh, did but you we'll write brush in? Over did that. you write it in? Was, it was. It, yeah, I, I should write in. I, I, I decided it was an alternate history, and therefore they could always say, "Well, it didn't pan out like that." But anyway, the Energia rocket, unlike the space shuttle system, could fly on its own, and it's a highly capable, if not one of the most capable rockets ever built, hmm. as a sort of heavy lift rocket it's it's perhaps the best rocket ever built until you know starship or sls come online it's it's like amazing yeah but the only time it flew without a baran was with this polyus spacecraft and it's a creepy photo of this kind of black funny looking uh spacecraft that's actually upside down on the energia as it flies up because it did this kind of weird flip maneuver but Polyus was this kind of massive orbital weapons platform where they were going to have lasers and bomb dropping capabilities and and you know bright sparking things and uh, anti satellite guns and everything else it was going to be this like this platform military platform in space but the launch went wrong so the energia rocket was fine but the actual Polyus didn't do didn't flip itself over properly and so it was so it it was lost, basically. Um, but, yeah, go and have a look at the pictures. I'm just having a look at it on, now. On and it's, it looks like it's something cr- from a dystopian nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a creepy, it's a creepy <laughs> horrible thing. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you, Chris. I, I, I think it's, it's annoying, isn't it? It's kind of inev- inevitable. And I think where we're at now is that we've got Russia and China and we've got Russia turning away from the International Space Station, turning to China. Mm. And it's not good, is it? No, no. I'm a little, I'm a kind of a little bit depressed by it. Anyway, would you like to hear my interview with someone who knows much more about this stuff than... I would than, uh, love to hear this. I'm so excited to hear this interview. A couple of British amateurs. Yeah, so this is Jeff Shessel. And um, uh, here it is. A Kutai. The Interplanetary Podcast. Putting the ace back into space. I'm joined on the podcast by Jeff Shessel, who's written a book called Mercury Rising. It's about John Glenn, John Kennedy, and the new battleground of the Cold War. Uh, welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's, it's absolutely my pleasure. Now, I've started reading the book, and it's really exciting, actually, because it's a, it's obviously it's a story that, uh, that I know quite well, and obviously the listeners know really well, but it does seem that you've dug out quite a lot of new information, particularly some of the letters that, that John Glenn wrote. Take us to the beginning. What, why did you take this on as a, as a subject? Well, here in the United States, growing up as I did in the 70s and the 80s, John Glenn was a very, very big figure. Um, and uh, he was also a political figure. He was serving in the U.S. Senate. In 1984, he ran for president, uh, not very successfully. Um, but he did run for president. So John Glenn has, has been a major figure in American life for a very long time. Uh, and I knew that that he had done this heroic thing. I knew that he was the first American to orbit the Earth. But as I thought more about the space race over time, I, I wanted to understand why the, the, the flight that he took, why the orbital flight that he took in February 62, why it was so significant. 
he was the first American to orbit the Earth, as I said, but he wasn't the first American in space for those here keeping count. He was the third. <laughs> he wasn't actually the first man to orbit the Earth. Yuri Gagarin and German Titov had done that uh, from the Soviet Union uh, prior to John Glenn. So why was the Glenn flight such a significant thing? And what became clear to me as I dug into the story was that a lot of it certainly has to do with who Glenn was. He was an incredibly appealing character. He was a charismatic figure. He seemed for generations of Americans to represent the best of the country, what they sort of hoped that we could produce and what we could be. But it was really ultimately the Cold War context of this flight and of the space race generally that made Glenn's flight so significant when it happened. It wasn't just another flight in this wonderful litany of all of these accomplishments in outer space. It happened at a moment um, at what John Kennedy called the hour of maximum danger. And so the stakes of Glenn's flight weren't just whether the United States was finally gonna catch up with the Soviet Union in the space race. The stakes actually seemed to be existential. And they were perceived that way, not just in the United States, but in Britain, in France, in West Germany, there was great concern across the free world whether the United States was going to be able to, to catch up with the Soviets. What was it about John Glenn's personality that, that made him this, I guess, the sort of focal point for this amazing moment in history? Glenn, Glenn was just a natural. He had a, an easy, sunny manner. He was incredibly appealing. He was attractive. He had a big smile. He had an attractive family. He was from a small town called New Concord in Ohio, uh, which is 70 miles away from Columbus, which is not a big town itself. But um, he, he's a real small town boy in the kind of classic American uh, mode. And yet he also was, of all of the Mercury 7 astronauts, was the most decorated combat pilot. Not all of them had even ever been in combat, but of the, the, the astronauts who had been combat pilots, he was, he was the, the most impressive, the most decorated. He was a, a fighter pilot um, in Korea as well uh, as, as in World War II. Uh, he was known for uh, flying too fast, too low, hurling himself toward targets, coming back to base with, with holes in his plane. He once circled back and, and went after a target a second time against orders from his commanding officer and came back with a hole in the tail of his plane the size of a, of a, a football. And he uh, was incredibly brave, incredibly daring, but wore it lightly. And so there was a, a great magnetism to Glenn, and, and he really stood out among the Mercury 7 astronauts. These were all some of the best pilots uh, that America had to offer at that time. But Glenn was really the only one of the seven who had ever spent any time really in front of a camera, who had ever spent time talking to the press. And he did it incredibly effectively. And the others were less comfortable in that role, which only allowed the kind of legend of Glenn, the profile of Glenn to, to grow and grow. But it's, I mean, it's, it's, it seems like a strange combination, doesn't it? The, the kind of daredevil. And the person and the confident public speaker, almost. I, I don't. It, it's not something that you readily put together. Was he? Was he also someone that was interested in politics, even when he was a Mercury astronaut? He was interested in in leadership, and leadership meant politics. Certainly, he was interested in politics. I think he was so focused on flying during those years, and so focused at first on becoming an astronaut, focused then on becoming the first to fly, which he didn't get to be, then becoming the first to take the orbital flight, which he did. And ultimately what he really wanted to do is what they all wanted to do. He wanted to go to the moon. He didn't get to do that, but he was very focused on flight. And yet from the moment that Glenn walked out onto the global stage, it was clear to everyone watching, both American news outlets and, and international news outlets, that this was a, an incredibly uh, appealing person who, had all the aura of a leader. And so the talk about Glenn as being a future, not just a future politician, but a future president began immediately in 1959 as, as soon as he was introduced to the world. American superhero, really. Well, right. And, and I should say that this is probably, probably obvious, but worth pointing out, the other six astronauts didn't necessarily <laughs> think all this was so wonderful. <laughs> 
first of all, Glenn seemed to be changing the rules of the game. I mean, these other guys were, again, accomplished combat pilots and or test pilots. They'd all been test pilots. And they were of the traditional mold of the fighter jock. They were kind of wisecracking, foul mouth. They, um, you know, uh, spent a lot of time uh, off the beaches with women who were not their wives. This was the 50s. This was the 60s. Um, what they thought was acceptable um, uh, was uh, seems to us now to be less so and, and, and stuck in a very different time. But, but Glenn was different. And uh, Glenn was also very religious. Um, he managed to be religious without being sanctimonious. But nonetheless, Glenn's insistence that he live by a, a different moral code and also increasingly his insistence that they live by the same moral code because they were role models, because the, the fate, not just of the space program, but it seemed of the free world was hanging on their success. He, he warned them repeatedly against uh, behaviors that he thought would jeopardize uh, their reputation and the, and the reputation and even the existence of the program. So a lot of the qualities that the public and the press adored in John Glenn um, did not make him so popular with his peers. No, which, which when they were choosing the first like you said, the first American in space. How, how come? How come it wasn't? How come it wasn't John Glenn and it was Shepard instead? Or, or was it really that that John Glenn knew that the only one that really counted was getting into orbit? <laughs> well, later that was what he said, and that's what others said. But they all wanted that first flight, uh, especially before Yuri Gagarin had gone up in April '61. Whoever went up first, it seemed, was going to be the first human being in space. And there was a lot of talk in the press about that this man, whoever it was, was going to be the next Columbus, was going to go down for, for centuries as this pioneer. And they all wanted that slot. And they figured the question of whether, so these were, as, as you're suggesting, these were not orbital flights at first um, that, that the Americans were taking. These were suborbital ballistic flights where they were essentially going up and falling down 15 minutes from start to finish. But on a certain level, it didn't matter. It was the symbolism of getting into space first. Um, it lost a lot of its gloss after the Soviets uh, you know, beat the US to the punch. And not only that, the, the Soviets didn't mess around with these suborbital flights, the very first man in space orbited the earth, Yuri Gagarin. And so the United States uh, was gonna take some time, almost a year to be able to, to do that. So they all wanted to, to go first. Um, but your question, why, why wasn't it Glenn? There's no clear answer to that because uh, the men who made that decision, the, the men in charge at, at NASA, and they were of course all men at that time, um, never really explained themselves. They never uh, wrote memoirs to, to, to reveal their thinking. And But here's what I was able to, to discern. Shepard and Glenn were clearly the leaders, both in terms of their ability and in terms of their personality. And I mean Al Shepard, who did become the first American in space. And Glenn was, as I said, sort of a celebrity. Glenn was the focus of all the newsreels. Glenn was the one that the reporters wanted to interview. Glenn was the one who was famous before the program even started. He had flown a, a jet across the country from LA to New York and set a record in 1957. Wound up on the front page of every newspaper in the United States, wound up on television. Glenn was a star. And the others, as I said, weren't so keen on that. And that wasn't just the other astronauts. It was his so-called superiors, it was his bosses at NASA. They didn't like the fact that, that Glenn had this public following, which they felt confined their choices a little bit. They had to, anytime they went out for a press conference, somebody would say, well, when's John Glenn gonna get to fly? And so there was some resentment of Glenn from top NASA officials as well. And so there, I think Shepard was absolutely perfectly qualified to be the first to fly without question. Was he a better pilot than Glenn? No, not necessarily. I think that that's a, a call that I think would be very hard for us 60 years later to make. The fact is both of them were perfectly able, perfectly well qualified for that first flight. But there was something about Glenn that was an irritant to the people in charge. 
And so he was not, as far as they were concerned, at the front of the line. They made him the backup. And he wasn't even second in the line. They made him the backup to Gus Grissom, who went second. And then finally, it, it became Glenn's turn. And it was just a good stroke of luck for him that by the time he came up to the top of the, the order, that it was time for an orbital flight. And that third flight wasn't supposed to be an orbital flight. But, but that, by that point, the embarrassment of continuing to send up suborbitals when the Soviets had now done it twice by that point, it just had to be converted into an orbital flight. Yeah, so did, that conversion then presumably came with a lot of risk. And if it did come with a lot of risk, who's who's actually pushing that? Because presumably, I mean, not, I mean, NASA were definitely more gun ho back then, but presumably they still were slightly risk averse. It, it, so, if there's an enormous risk, is, is it John? Is it the political system then? John Kennedy knows that this is now getting, like you said, existential. Politics had a lot to do with it. And there was a continual tension in the space program in those years. And it wasn't unique to those years, but this was, of course, the first time they were really grappling with it, where uh, sometimes the politicians were ahead of the engineers. And uh, the White House certainly saw an imperative at this point to get on with it. And yet, John Kennedy also, I should be clear, recognized that if he pushed NASA too far too fast and they did something that was unsafe, and that somebody like John Glenn were to, to die in orbit or uh, to, you know, to have the rocket blow up on the launch pad, that it would not only be a human tragedy, but it would be a, a colossal embarrassment for the United States on the world stage. And that wasn't, so the politicians were often pretty risk averse as well. There was a kind of back and forth. And within NASA, there was not a single opinion as to whether they were ready to do this sort of thing. There were arguments going on within NASA where some said, we've got to do it, we're ready to do it. And others were saying, mm, let's do some more chimpanzee flights. Let's do some more animal tests so we can be sure these rockets are ready. But the, the, the switch that, that we're talking about here from suborbitals to orbitals meant a switch in rockets. The suborbitals had gone up on the Redstone rocket, which was a pretty reliable rocket as far as the US was concerned, but it wasn't powerful enough to push a heavy object like a capsule all the way into orbit. It could push it into space, but not far enough into space that it would, that it would remain in orbit. So that had to wait for a rocket called the Atlas. And the Atlas was a terrific missile. It was developed by the Air Force as, a, as an ICBM to carry a nuclear payload. It was very good at that. But as soon as you stuck a, a capsule on the top of the thing, it became pretty dangerous and pretty unreliable. And the Atlas had kind of a terrible track record for, for years. These things were blowing up, they were going awry, they were dumping their, their payload, which thankfully didn't include any astronauts at that point, into the, into the Atlantic Ocean. And so it took a, a while before um, that particular rocket, the Atlas, um, was what NASA called man-rated, that it was safe enough to put, put a man on top of. But you know, I should, I should add this. There's no, this is not a binary choice. It's either safe or unsafe. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is a, a complex calculation involving a, a shocking number of variables. And then you get a number at the end of that and you have to make a gut call. And in fact, the president of the company that was building the Atlas rocket for the US government on the eve of John Glenn's flight said that he would rate the reliability of that rocket at 80%, 80%, mm. which meant that there was a one in five chance that something terrible was gonna happen. And they just had to go with it. As Chris Kraft, the flight director said, if, if I ever thought about the odds, we'd never get to the launch pad. Yeah, I mean, that, that's terrifying. You, well, you certainly wouldn't fly with those odds or get in someone's car. Can you so, imagine? Yeah, I mean, would, would, have John, would John Glenn have been aware of those odds? I mean, because obviously he's a daring, he's a daring type of person. Would, would, he have, would he have known about those odds? Absolutely. He was well aware of the odds. None of this was hidden from the astronauts. Um, and of course, they had different thresholds. They, these are daring guys. I mean, these were test pilots. Their job was to take these complex pieces of machinery and test the outer limits of what the, the machines could do. Uh, this, this was a different ballgame flying into space. You can't parachute out when you're, when you're in space. 
um, if the if the worst happens. And so uh, they recognized that there were tremendous risks. And in fact, the astronauts had a had a private conversation around this time, the seven astronauts, and they all agreed it was inevitable. They thought that one of them was going to get killed. And it was just a question of which one and when. So was this the moment? Uh, Glenn couldn't be sure. And one of the interesting things that, that I found in his archives, uh, in his belongings, um, is uh, uh, the script of a, a recording that he made for his children. Glenn publicly was the picture of absolute calm, absolute confidence. He was asked all the time as his flight was approaching, whether he felt that he was gonna be safe, whether he felt he would come home. Um, and he always, he assured the public, he even assured John Kennedy in the Oval Office. Kennedy was very nervous about this. And Glenn, Glenn reassured him that NASA had done everything that, that anyone could conceivably do to, to make this flight safe. And yet, as Glenn was preparing to, to go, he thought a lot about it and he really had to come to terms with the fact that he might not be coming back. He wrote a long letter to his children, um, telling them uh, what sort of lives he hoped they would lead. And then he thought some more and, and, and realized that maybe that he hadn't said everything that he wanted to say. And so he wrote himself this script for a recording. He made one for his kids and one for his wife and they were only to be played, these real to real tapes. They were only to be played if he died in the course of the mission. And it's, it's chilling, very moving reading. I mean, it begins uh, by just stating its purposes very plainly. He begins, if you hear this, I've been killed. And he goes on to talk about his views of an afterlife, uh, which he believed in very much. He, he talks about the funeral and the fact that they might have to have a funeral at Arlington National Cemetery in Washington with no body because the body might be lost in space or something, uh, you know, or, or, or an exploding rocket might have made that an impossibility. And he talks to his kids who were teenagers at the time about how he wants them to conduct himself and even arranges for a signal that he wants to, to send them uh, from the afterlife so that they know that he's, he's okay. It's very moving reading and it, it's just clear. This is a very long recording that he made. And then, as I said, he made another for his wife that he was really reckoning with the fact that he might in fact become the first man to die in space. These are military men and, and presumably every time he flew off an aircraft carrier and, and did sorties in Korea, he must have been thinking similar things. Absolutely. He was thinking similar things. His wife, Annie, was thinking similar things. There was an aspect of this that was very familiar. I mean, anytime he went out on a combat mission, anytime he did a test flight, there was the chance that he wasn't going to come back. But there was a level of danger and a level of uncertainty involved in riding this missile into space, this missile that had such a history, as I said, of exploding on the launch pad or exploding in midair. And so it was a new kind of danger and a danger that he couldn't really control. I think the thing about Glenn, and this is what made him such an incredible pilot, was that he, he, never, he never panicked, no matter what the circumstances. I mentioned this moment when a hole the size of a football was blown in the tail of his plane. He got that back to base. There was another occasion um, in Korea where Glenn watched his commanding officer get shot down over North Korea, right along the, the Chinese border. And Glenn circled and circled and circled. And then at a certain point recognized that um, he didn't have enough fuel to get back to base. So he rocketed his jet up to 40,000 feet and then the engine cut out. This was actually, it was his plan. He knew this was gonna happen. And he glided that plane, he glided across the entirety of North Korea until he got back to the base in South Korea. The window began to frost over because he had no power in the plane. So this is, this is a guy who, who knew how to stay cool, but, but in that situation, he had control. When you're sitting strapped to a rocket, you don't. One thing you cannot do is to change what that rocket is gonna do. And there are also certain orbital mechanics, once you're in the capsule, you're free of the rocket and you're in space that you cannot control. There's some things you can, some things you can't. So there was a whole new set of dangers that made this um, uh, more terrifying if you let yourself think about it. 
Yeah, I mean, I know recently, obviously, a lot of programs have dealt with the families and and how they coped. <laughs> they're really, in some ways, they're they're the true heroes, aren't they? Because like his wife and his kids, they must have also known the dangers and 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 had to live live through it. And I know that it's a it's a sort of theme that gets picked up by quite a few modern dramas now that that's probably less talked about at the time. <laughs> It was agonizing for the families. And Glenn, Glenn was the oldest astronaut. Um, and so his kids were the oldest of all the astronaut children. Um, some of the, the other astronauts' kids were too young uh, at the time even to remember when their fathers flew. But, but Glenn's kids, as I said, were in high school. They were well aware. And actually, Glenn, um, Glenn always assured them that everything was going to be OK. He always assured them that he would refuse to fly if, if it wasn't the case. But they worried. Of course, they were going to worry. And they had been witness to all of these events as well. They had been witness to these rockets that were blowing up. They knew how dangerous it was. And so it's uh, really it's it's quite um, uh, it's quite a burden for the family to carry. And um, I felt very lucky that both of Glenn's children, uh, David and, and Lynn Glenn, uh, talked to me, um, gave me interviews in the course of working on this book, and they spoke very frankly about um, how, how terrifying this was for, for them. They were old enough to know just how dangerous it was. Did, did, did they ever get chance to listen to the message that John Glenn had left them? It doesn't seem so. I, I asked them and neither one of them even knew that it existed. Wow. Uh, I was unable to track down the tapes. Um, I did find, as I said, this script, but, um, I do know that the tapes existed and were sent because I, I do know that, when Glenn was in the capsule on top of the rocket, sitting on the launch pad, waiting for the countdown to, to, you know, to reach zero, he, he called his wife to say goodbye. And he was patched through by radio link to talk to Annie and to talk to his kids. And one of the last things that he said to Annie was, did you get the tapes? I sent you two recordings. Did you get them? And she said she did. Now, whether Annie went and listened to them later, it seems very unlikely to me. It would be a horrible thing to have to listen to. Um, uh, but the kids don't know anything about it. Um, at least they, they don't remember anything about it. And I think that's the sort of thing that you would remember if, yeah. you, if you'd <laughs> have to bit. listen to it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, yeah, I wonder if they're in a dusty box somewhere. I, I looked in a lot of dusty boxes to try to find them. They could still exist somewhere, but yeah. I, I had no success. And I wouldn't be surprised, frankly, if it, it after the flight returned and was was safe, uh, if Annie just threw the tapes away and destroyed them. Yeah, did, I, I'm, I'm so I'm assuming the kids have now read the script, or or do, do you not know? Well, they they both have copies of my book, um, I and I have man. not yet heard um, uh, whether they've whether they've read that part. Um, but we did talk about the tapes um, uh, when when you know when I conducted these interviews. But um, but I, 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 I I'll be interested, of course, yeah. to to know yeah. if they have a reaction. When John Glenn got this orbital flight and and presumably it became pretty clear that this was that the whole american nation and like you said the whole of europe's watching and and russia's watching and it's becoming this big deal did john glenn realize that essentially he was kissing goodbye to his ticket to the moon because he would be too, he would be too too much of a hero to ever risk again he didn't know that. He didn't think that. Um, and I think um, there was a moment after his return when it seemed like he would be first in line because he had done the most impressive thing that any of the astronauts had done to date. I mean, this was a real flight. <laughs> this was three times around the earth. This wasn't 15 minutes up and down. And so Glenn, for a period of time, would seem to have the, the strongest claim and was certainly the most uh, identified um, globally with the program. Um, and so Glenn hoped and expected to get another Mercury flight later in the rotation. That didn't happen. He hoped to be assigned to, to Gemini. That didn't happen. Um, and Glenn stuck around being essentially a good soldier in the program and kind of got the runaround from his uh, bosses at NASA who wouldn't tell him that he was being ruled out, but would tell him that he might want to just think about 
his future a little bit. And maybe he wanted to be in administration somewhere to have a sort of a senior desk job at NASA, which was not of any interest to him at all. He wanted to fly. And he stuck around long, long enough that it became clear that he was never going to get that slot. And no official reason was ever provided him. No official reason was ever written down. A rumor began to circulate that it had been ruled out by President Kennedy himself, that Kennedy had decided that Glenn was too valuable to risk again, that he was simply too important a symbol to the nation. And this was a guy who clearly had a political future that um, they didn't want to send him up. And there were times in later decades when Glenn himself would say that this was what he heard. Um, but I think that's not the case. Kennedy never actually intervened and said that Glenn shouldn't fly again. He was very interested in, in Glenn as a potential politician, but he didn't knock him out of contention. I think that was the sort of thing that, that people said to make Glenn feel better, that sometimes Glenn said to make himself feel better. But the bottom line was that he was quite unpopular in the upper reaches of NASA, and he was not going to get prioritized. And uh, he stuck around long enough for that to become clear. Oof. Yeah, that must have been that, that must have been quite disappointing. I mean, it, it, I've always thought that that's odd that someone like Kennedy would say, "Don't send this person," because in the same breath, you're also saying, "Well, so and so's life isn't worth as much as John Glenn's." Right, because, it, yeah. it seems you know Neil Armstrong's not as worth as much as John Glenn. It's okay to stick him on. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> it seems very odd, doesn't it? So. Yeah, so John Glenn's actual flight, obviously, <laughs> we know was ex extremely exciting in terms of it did turn out that it was pretty dangerous. <laughs> uh, was there was there any kind of insights you got into that element of it, the the heat shield and it all falling off and things like that 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 surprised you when you were researching the book? Well, y yes, um, because I think if uh, if we know anything about Glenn's flight, we know it was this tremendous success. And we know that he came home safe, that he was around for many decades after that, that there were parades, 4 million people came out in New York City, the biggest crowd since the end of World War II, to, to wish him well and to throw ticker tape and so forth. We know it came out okay. And so it was surprising to me to learn that uh, actually, as I said, he orbited three times. At the end of his first trip around the Earth, the autopilot began to malfunction. And the, the capsule began like a car with its wheels out of alignment. The, the, the capsule would begin to essentially skate to the right. And then the thrusters would automatically kick in and, and move it back into alignment. And then it would drift again. And then the thrusters would kick in again. And it was wasting a tremendous amount of fuel. There was clearly something wrong. So Glenn had to take over and fly it manually, which on a certain level, even though that wasn't the plan, he wasn't too unhappy about that. I was going to say, it almost sounds like he did it deliberately. <laughs> <laughs> you, would, you, you, you might think so. I, these guys always wanted to fly the capsules and they were always bitterly frustrated when NASA told them they weren't allowed to do it. Mm. And so this was actually okay with Glenn, but something else happened around the same time, one orbit into this three orbit flight. And that was that at NASA in mission control in the control center, a little warning light went on one of the consoles and one of the flight controllers spotted it immediately. And what that light meant, if it was right, was that Glenn's heat shield had started to separate a little bit from the rest of the capsule. And that was something that was actually supposed to happen just before splashdown, that just before hitting the ocean, the thing was supposed to separate a little bit to provide kind of a cushion so it didn't impact so severely. But it's certainly not supposed to happen in space. If it happens in space, and then Glenn tries to come through the atmosphere to get back home, he would be incinerated immediately. I mean, that heat shield is there for a purpose. And if there's the slightest breach between the heat shield and the capsule, it's all over. And so that's what this light said, was that this was a problem. They decided not to ask Glenn directly about it because they thought he would panic. Now, anybody who knew Glenn's history, as I was describing before, should have known this wasn't a guy who panicked. In fact, he was chosen because he doesn't panic. Yeah. 
in dangerous situations like this. But they thought that maybe a, a, a guy in space who realizes that he might not be coming home safely, maybe he would panic. So let's not tell him about it. Let's ask him kind of roundabout questions and see if we can learn anything. So at one point after this light goes on and Glenn doesn't know that the light's gone on, they say, are, are you hearing any banging noises? It's right there in the transcript, in the recording. It's incredible. They say, are you hearing any banging noise? Which is an incredible thing to be asked when you are more than 100 miles above the Earth's surface in orbit. And they don't tell him why they're asking. He says, no, I'm not hearing any banging noises. And it goes on like this. Um, they continue to ask him these indirect questions to see if they can piece together what's really going on up there. And meanwhile, in mission control, they spend the last two orbits of Glenn's flight in a, in, in a cold panic. Because again, this means sure death if it's true. And it could be uh, an erroneous signal, they're not sure. And so they begin to put together a plan for how they might get him back if in fact it has started to separate from the capsule, the heat shield. And they make the decision to let him leave this little, it's called the retro pack. It was a little package of, of uh, little jets at the bottom of, uh, of the heat shield um, that was supposed to be jettisoned before it comes back through the atmosphere. They said, well, why don't you leave that thing attached? That Maybe that will clamp the heat shield to the capsule and protect you. But again, they tell him to do these things without telling him why. And over time, he begins to piece this together that he's in some serious danger and the worst part of it is that they won't talk to him about it. Yeah, did did he actually did he actually demonstrate that frustration, knowing that obviously something's up and they're not talking to him, knowing that, <laughs> that he's really the person that needs to know and that he's not gonna panic. And it's like, why don't you trust me here? He's very restrained. He knows that he's being recorded, he's being heard around the world. Um and uh he's also uh, of the mindset of a, of a Marine pilot taking orders. Um, that is what he's supposed to do. But at a certain point, he's been asked enough of these indirect questions that he loses his patience. And they say, uh, John, we want you to come back in through the atmosphere and just leave the retro pack on. And he finally cracks a little bit and he says, is there a reason for this? Uh, what is the reason? And there's silence on the line and they say, well, Cape Canaveral will tell you. There's no reason. There's no reason for this. Um, Cape Canaveral will talk to you about it. And when he passes over Cape Canaveral, they don't tell him about it. And that's the only slight crack uh, in, in the facade. But boy, when he gets back, he lets them know how unhappy he was about it. And he did a very good job of not letting this get out publicly. But he made very clear throughout NASA how unhappy he was and how this could never happen again to any other astronaut that if they are in danger, they need to be told. Because if they're not told, they can't do anything about it. And he believed, uh, again, as a pilot who had gotten himself out of more than one seemingly deadly predicament, that maybe he could have done something about it. Um, but thankfully, in fact, the warning light was incorrect. The whole thing uh, was, uh, was, need was a needless concern, um, but they sure couldn't know about it until he got back safely. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, overall, this this entire experience has been. I I, I, I you may forgive me for turning it into a football match, but it, <laughs> it's like it's like being in a football match, and the the Russians are obviously two nil up at this point, and John Glenn has literally managed to get a goal back, but it's certainly not over, is it? At this point, it's like at least we've got a goal back. But it's 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 now it's the race for the moon, isn't it? In terms of we we it's we've got to be the first on the moon. But is that getting the goal back? Did did for for the Western world did that seem like a really big like a really big deal at the time, or was it something that that took a while to sort of filter through as a as as a kind of pivotal moment? What's interesting about it is that the the effect was instantaneous. It was like a collective exhalation of breath across the free world. Um, there were rapturous editorials written in London and Paris, all, all around the, the world, um, certainly in, in, in West Berlin, um, at what this meant 
And what it meant was that the United States really was capable of competing with the Soviet Union. And yes, the Soviets were still ahead. And yes, the space race was ongoing. It was far from over. And there was this goal of, of a lunar landing that was well ahead. Uh, so nobody thought that it, it was over and won or that it was even uh, level, um, as you said. Um, and yet up to that point, it was not even clear that the United States should be in the game. Mm. The United States was so far behind and the, the stakes seemed to extend well beyond space. There were polls taken, polls taken in, in there was a poll taken in Britain around the time of John Kennedy's inauguration, which, and, and not just in Britain, but in France and West Germany, and the results were, were almost identical. Uh, which country, the US or the Soviet Union, will be ahead militarily in 10 years? And the poll said 44% in, in Britain believed that the Soviets would be ahead in 10 years. 19% thought the US would be ahead. 44 to 19. And so much of that had to do with the space race and what it symbolized, the sense that the two nations were going head to head technologically and one was winning and it was winning by, by a, you know, a, a good deal of distance. And that seemed to, to signal a shift in the balance of powers internationally, the balance of power. And so the world was hanging on the results of this flight, and it all seemed to hang on the ability of John Glenn to get into orbit. And so once he had done that, yes, the Soviets had done it twice. The, the Americans had only done it once. But what this signaled, again, was the U.S. was capable and the U.S. was, was, was back in the game. Yeah, it really is. It's, def it's definitely the, the netting a goal when it looks like you're going to get trounced. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah, I mean, it's it's... Yeah, it's amazing that it's so instantaneous. I mean, the one thing that's that that someone who's born after that era is it's hard for me. It's hard, you know, growing up in a in a completely different time, is it's hard to see things in these big global, um, very kind of polarized movements of communism versus capitalism and you know it's it's like the soviet way or the or the the american way and to sort of bring it into the kind of modern context cuz cuz where are we at now in terms of we've got a resurgent china that is that's clearly um showing some pretty decent teeth when it comes to space these days and so you've got and, and you've got america that that is that's gone through a bit of a a rough patch when it came to space at the end of the space shuttle era but you've got commercial space coming in but it's but we have less of these clear pictures of you know america america versus china in terms of systems in terms of like these kind of ideologies so how is it how is it you know what are the lessons learned from that era and how does it look like in a kind of in a, in a much more nebulous political world that we're in now <laughs> oh, no, know there's, there's a lot to unpack in that one <laughs> yeah, well there is a lot but but you know it's it's an excellent question because it really goes right to the heart of uh, the story that I'm I'm trying to tell in the book um that this was not just seen as a competition between two countries about who gets where first this was a global contest between two systems, as you said. And the question is, which system is better equipped to win the future and to create the future? And it wasn't just a matter of the free world and the communist bloc. There were a whole range of countries that were emerging from colonialism around the world, countries in Africa, countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia, they were called at the time the uncommitted nations. And they were said to be deciding which system they were gonna choose, which system seemed to offer the, the greatest opportunity for their people, the greatest opportunity for, for rapid technological and economic advancement. And they were, people in those countries and the governments of those countries were watching these two systems, which system seems like the future. And there was a lot of deep doubt, even within the West, especially within the West, whether democracy had sort of 
had its moment and whether a democracy with all its internal division, with all of its empowered groups, with all of the voices that get to contribute to or stymie a decision, whether a democracy was really capable of mounting a challenge in this new technological era. And the Soviet system, the communist system, with its kind of single-minded dedication to certain national and global goals, Maybe that was a more effective approach. And it seemed to a lot of observers, observers that maybe it was. Certainly there was a lot of doubt right here in the United States on that question. Maybe democracy just wasn't up to the challenge. And so that was one of the things that was at stake in John Glenn's flight. So fast forwarding to today, we certainly don't have as neat a division as, as you did in, in the early 1960s between this world and that world and um, between two Cold War adversaries that sort of rise above and loom above everybody else. At the same time, there is, as we know, there are a lot of uh, doubts about democracy right now, about the viability of this system uh, as fractious as it be has become, as self-defeating as it often is. And meanwhile, China has been steadily and, 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 and quite aggressively advancing as a power, technologically, economically, militarily, and all of those things are tied together. So when, I don't know, uh, you'll have to tell me how, whether people reacted this way in, in the UK, but when people in the United States saw China land its uh, it's it's uh, lander successfully on Mars, right on the heels of of, of the U.S. doing that. Those pictures um, circulated a lot here uh, in the United States. And in fact, the NASA administrator uh, Bill Nelson held that photo up twice during a congressional hearing just last week, and he said, "Here's your sign, right here. This is what's going on. This is why, as he said, we've got to get off our duffs." There is the sense that the, that the the not just China but its system, its autocratic system, uh, poses a, a profound challenge to the democratic order. And space is is one of many symbols of our ability to compete. Yeah, I mean it's yeah, I mean it it, it definitely wasn't as big a news story here in 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 Europe or well certainly not in Britain in terms of that's not it's almost like that's not the narrative here at all and and i know i know and i know when i've talked to people who you know know about the story they you know it it feels for some europeans i think maybe it feels as though it's oh here we go again it's it's america kind of <laughs> siding itself against an opposition and there's a little there's a little bit of me that gets quite excited about it because i know that you get these huge enormous progress from it you know that uh, you know it'll push america into going to the moon and and doing the exciting things but i, I know that a lot obviously there's like you said there's there's a lot of doubt in in democracy and, and in particular capitalist democracies and and it, and it and and it kind of plays into that narrative and it's so easy to see like the the the, the american response either way almost it's like where well, it's just a, a america saber rattling or you know and and in a way it's a kind of i don't know britain's a little bit to to blame because of our kind of colonial past and things like that that people are a little bit you know cautious of imperial america in particular so yeah it, it how how does America get on the right side of the debate where where it's like pointing out the dangers of a, you know, an ascendant China, and losing all that hard work that that democracy, you know, the the freedom, the free world, and and what democracy's given us, you know, how does America get in the right frame to kind of <laughs> stop the rot almost? Is <laughs> This is a very profound <laughs> question, and one we're one we're facing every day. I mean, here we are talking about going to Mars, and and we've got this you know fantastic helicopter flying right now on Mars, and that's thrilling and it's exciting. But meanwhile, here in Washington, uh, the Congress is arguing over whether uh, we can finally pass an infrastructure bill and repair our roads and bridges, and we can't seem to agree uh, that our roads and bridges. Uh, will be repaired, even though everyone understands that they need to be. So 
Uh, I mean, democracy has created uh, plenty of challenges for itself, um, and uh, uh, autocracies like China are presenting another kind of challenge. And so I think that what the the choice that, that President Biden is, is facing right now in space is very similar in many ways to the choice that John Kennedy faced. And I think the imperative is the same as well. We don't get to opt out of, of that competition, that it is not the Olympics. This is not a sporting match. This is, um, this is really big stuff and it's, uh, and, and it's um, our national security and our economic security that are at stake. I mean, one of the things that has been going on um, while NASA has been um, making these wonderful scientific advances uh, on Mars and, and, and elsewhere um, in our solar system, uh, that uh, both China and Russia have been uh, dramatically increasing what are called their counter space capabilities, which is their abilities to, to disrupt or, or destroy or disable the satellite systems on which we all rely uh, for you know everything from predictable shipping to telephone uh, to, uh, communications, cell phone communications to television and radio and everything else. And also, by the way, our, our militaries are entirely reliant now on these reconnaissance satellites and so forth. So uh, their ability uh, to, um, to, to create havoc in near earth orbit is extremely consequential. So President Biden, I think has already made some signals that he recognizes this and we need to step up our presence in space. Um, and it's not all just about getting back to the moon. It's about uh, ensuring our own safety and security right here in, 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 in our own neighborhood around the earth. Is there, is there a frustration in America with, with the European response to it as well? Do, the, do, do, do Americans feel as though Europe should be kind of putting more effort in and putting more, more resources behind it? Or, do, or, do, or, or, or the opposite? Or do, does it feel as though Europe's p pulling its weight in, the, in, in that element? <laughs> Well, to be honest, and this is, um, you know, this is probably another sign of, of American arrogance, but I, I don't think that, I think there is a sense in, in the United States, particularly now decades after the, the space race and the successful landing on the moon multiple times, um, that space is what we do. It is an American thing. Um, and that we have not had a succession of other nations landing on the moon, that in fact, it continues to be only Americans who have, have put boots on the moon. And so there is a kind of an American exceptionalism that I think we hold to when it comes to space. And yet we have not always, uh, despite that, um, I, I think there, there has been a kind of complacency that, that has set in as a result of that, that America, once it captured the lead and extended its lead, didn't have to do very much to sustain it. And NASA has been in a perpetual struggle for decades just to get enough funding to do the things that it's already supposed to do, never mind these, these new missions. And so I, I think there is a moment right now of, of some reckoning that the United States has to step up. And I, and I don't think that this is quite the same as something like climate, where there's a recognition that we can only really do this successfully in concert with other nations. I think there is a sense here, uh, accurately or not, that uh, if 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 we're going to compete in space, that this is something that just, we have to do on our own, not without partners. Um, we have partners in, uh, in 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 space activities of of lots of different kinds, but ultimately the burden rests on on America's shoulders. Yeah, is there? Uh, uh, funnily, if it, it came up in the podcast a, a few weeks ago about about India. And obviously, India has a massive like rivalry with China, and it's and it's it's got a sort of similar trajectory in in space. Can you can you see India entering a kind of uh, a, a democracy versus, a democracy versus an autocracy kind of space race as well? I think there are a lot of nations that are getting in the game. Um, Israel has has just made an attempt. Um, uh, the United Arab Emirates, as I understand it. Um, there are a lot of countries now that are technologically sophisticated enough um, that they can not only do lots of interesting things in orbit, but they could conceivably send people to the moon. They can conceivably send objects to Mars as the as China has just done and as Russia did long ago in the, the 1970s. And so I think that you are seeing increasingly an internationalization of space exploration, which on its face is a wonderful thing if that is dedicated to peaceful purposes. 
if it is dedicated to what I called a minute ago counter space capabilities, then we have a much more dangerous situation here on Earth. Would so in if that's the case, would it be, would it be better for for the Americans and the Europeans and the Indians and and everyone else to sort of get China to the table and say, okay, let's let's be more collaborative because obviously China have been kind of cut out a little bit of of in of international space collaboration you know you know they're not involved with the international space station um is it time to sort of say okay let's let's actually instead of like <laughs> escalating this bringing guns to a knife fight let's let's actually just get rid of all the knives and, and is that feasible or do you think that 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 China are past that I do think it's still feasible I do think that um there has been some discussion of uh, creating uh, some kind of partnership, some kind of collaboration with, with China in space. There has actually been a long tradition of collaboration between the United States and, and Russia in space. Although as this new Cold War between the US and Russia intensifies, that's become more difficult. And what you saw recently was Russia align itself with China in space, which is exactly what we don't want to have happen, as you're suggesting, to have a, a kind of very active Cold War realignment in space, where you either have the US going it alone against these powers on the other side, or even the US in concert with, with other nations in a very adversarial posture uh, against Russia and China. So I, I know that there are some diplomatic efforts um, and some efforts uh, in, the, in the world of, of, of science and engineering to try to bridge that gap before it becomes unbridgeable. But it is, it is very challenging because uh, it is difficult to have true collaboration in space if you don't have it on Earth. And so all of these things, um, you know, are subject <laughs> yeah. uh, to, to that. Is there a chance that the the private sector in America is really actually going to be the knight in silver <laughs> armor here in terms of it's going to come riding to the rescue, the, the, the Musks and the Bezoses, in terms of that is going to be where you find the strength of democracy and the, and the, and the strength of, of that system and say, look, you know, this is, <laughs> this is what you get. This is the, these, the, these are the rewards that you reap. It, it, I mean, because for me, that looks like a pretty big possibility. It is a big possibility. It's a growing possibility. And it's just incredible what, what SpaceX in particular has been able to do already. And Blue Origin, I know, is not counting itself out of this competition. Um, and they're not the only ones. Um, I think that what we are seeing uh, in terms of the private sector's role in space exploration and how dramatically that's ramped up and the commercialization of space is, um, depending on how you look at it, it is a success story of, of, of the democratic system. It is a success story of capitalism, at least, um, that companies like these are able to muster this much expertise and, and this many resources to, to do these incredible things. NASA itself has become very reliant on, on these companies um, to get its, its astronauts up there into space and so forth. So I, I do think they will continue to, to play a role. I think ultimately, however, whether this is a, a, a dangerous place to go, space is gonna depend on the decisions made by governments and the actions taken or not taken by militaries uh, around the world. And so government, no matter what Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and others are able to do in space, ultimately our collective security is going to have to be ensured uh, by governments and, and by the, 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 the military efforts of, of our countries. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty pivotal moment, isn't it, in, in history, I suppose. And, and space is going to play a very big role in it. Yeah, I'd, I've got one question that, that occurred to me while we were talking is why when why is it that John Glenn was went from sort of being this ultimate hero? Why is it that his political uh, his his run for the White House? Why didn't he succeed? What 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 <laughs> what was it about John Glenn that was it the wrong was it bad timing or was it something that had the same thing that had that had wound up his NASA officials. Was that the same thing that, that had happened on a, in the, to the general public? 
No, I think it was something different, actually. And it's it's such an interesting question, because when you look, and I urge you or anybody to go back and look on YouTube at these, these films of John Glenn in 1959, at that very first press conference where the astronauts are introduced, or, or really anything at that time, he's he's like a movie star. And, and you can certainly see why people thought he was a potential president, even then, um, even when he was 39 years old. Um, they looked and thought, you know, this, this could be the guy. And yet it turned out that as a politician, when he actually became one, um, that, that Glenn was, was not, that he didn't bring that kind of charisma to the role. Uh, what he brought was another quality that he always had all along, which is a kind of serious mindedness um, and a little bit of prickliness as well. He did not do a fantastic job of building uh, uh, the kind of deep, bonds and, and, and relationships in the United States Senate. He was a heavyweight because he was, uh, a, a, you know, he'd been a big deal a lot longer than any of the rest of them. And he was smart and he was focused and he was well-prepared and he thought about big issues. And yet he was not, it turned out, a, a, a hail fellow well-met, a kind of backslapping politician who swept people up in, in his way of, of, of looking at the world. Um, he was not a, an inspirational speaker. He was sort of a dull speaker when it came down to it. And so he was never really able to fulfill this notion that so many had of him in the early 1960s. He spent a lot of time in the U.S. Senate. He had a very long and productive career. Um, but when he decided to run for president in 1984 to challenge Ronald Reagan, uh, first he had to win the nomination, of course. And at, at first, the Reagan White House was was scared of Glenn. They thought he was the, the Democrat. Um, he was the Democrat that they were most worried about. And then as it developed, he 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 did poorly in the primaries and fell out reasonably early in, in the contest. Um, he just didn't have on the stump the, the, what it took. Um, and he was out distanced by um, people who were nowhere near as um, uh, as um, kind of dazzling as he had been as an astronaut, um, but were more effective at the work of being a politician and building a coalition. Right, just it just goes to show you can't be good at everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't be good at everything. You know, he was pretty good at being a senator. He wasn't so great at being a politician. And there was part of him that um, took some pride in that, but it definitely limited what he was able to do. I'm right in saying he's still the oldest astronaut as well, though, isn't he? Yes. Well, of course, and, and he went back into space in 1998. I closed my book with this episode because it's just such a wonderful kind of mm. closing of the, the circle. But um, he lobbied very successfully to get a slot on the space shuttle and went up in, in 1998, uh, ostensibly to study the effects of aging on the astronaut on the space flight. Uh, and um, he managed to convince the NASA administrator and President Bill Clinton, my old boss, that, uh, that, that, that this, was a, this was a good mission for him. And um, so he did, he did go back up and, and he was in fact, at that time, uh, the oldest, he was 77. He was the oldest to, to go into space. Yeah, well, I mean, he he's definitely the all American hero, and it's uh, it's it's always it's always like really fascinating to to sort of see how those people go from fighter pilot. Imagine him sitting in his cockpit as a fighter pilot, not knowing the life that he's going to have later on. It's just incredible, isn't it? Really, it is incredible, especially because at the time that he was a fighter pilot, nobody could envision that life because it hadn't been invented yet. Yeah. <laughs> there weren't there weren't these things. I mean, he was. I mean, it's worth repeating, part of the first astronaut corps ever created. I mean, when those seven pilots walked out and, and suddenly they were referred to as astronauts rather than pilots, that was a term, astronaut, that, that a, a bunch of guys sat around a room and came up with. This was a new concept. And, uh, and, and they helped to define it um, because a lot of these things were not yet worked out and would have to be worked out actually by doing it. It's a fantastic story, and I've, been, I've the the bit of the book, the bits of the book that I've I've read are, are really really fascinating, and obviously it's brilliantly brilliantly written as well. Um, yeah, it's a great story. Thanks very much, and and loads to think about in terms of the similarities to now as it was back then. I think. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's been great, great talking with you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. The Interplanetary Podcast. 
is alive. There you go, Chris. Fantastic. That was. I, I, t- I, t- I tell you what, I really enjoyed that interview. He was really, really nice guy as well. Re- just and and I got a lot of time out of him <laughs> as well. So that was great. I've got some amazing news that I really should have put at the beginning of this podcast. Okay, and that is we should welcome into the world. Mr. Franklin. Oh, man. Welcome to the world, little mate. That is amazing news, yeah. man. Amazing. Yeah. Lovely stuff. Lovely How stuff. How cool is that? Congratulations, Jamie. Oh, mate. What an absolute total legend. Total legends. Fantastic. So well, well done. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> That's brilliant news, man. A bit like early cosmonauts, Jamie wasn't shooting blanks. <laughs> <laughs> quality i like it we like, like we like a comedy call back on this show we always have uh what are you doing this week oh matthew, on this bank holiday week t- uh, matthew i am still quarantining thankfully oh, my my day eight test has come back negative and that means on tuesday i am going to get on my bicycle and go out for several hours and i cannot wait and then me and me and, wife, me and my wife are going to go for a meal in liverpool because it's been too long. <laughs> so how about you? Um, yeah, I'm, well, I'm going to enjoy the sunshine, I think. I'm going to try and get out as often as I can. Yes, mate. Uh, especially considering there's a few things opening up on the seafront now and I can have a cocktail Oof. while watching the waves sip into the harbour. Um, although I shall be working hard except tomorrow. So I might, you know, sit up with my feet up playing Queen songs for my other podcast. Ah, good. nice little plug there. I like it. <laughs> yeah, see what I did there. Now, if you wa- if people wanted to read the notes for this um, particular podcast and, and links to uh, Jeff Shessel's book, which is out this week as well, um, then where should they go, Chris? Uh, how about uh, interplanetary.org.uk? That's a very good shout, www.interplanetary.org.uk. Or if you want to join the Spodcats, why don't you fly over to www.patreon.com forward slash interplanetary and uh, join us on the Discord, etc., etc. We love you, Spodcats. We love you. Yeah, we definitely love the Spodcats. Um, Yeah, so uh, that's it, Chris. Shall we let everyone go? No, you cannot leave. We control the you universe now. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, because that, 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 they'll probably shoot us. <laughs> It'll start a space war. <laughs> pew, 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 there, pew, there's someone pew. With a, there's someone with a lightsaber right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could do a really good uh, Chewbacca impression, but I actually can't. Like, I can do R2-D2, like, no. that's that easy, you know. <laughs> 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 no, nah, see, I can't do it. <laughs> no, I can't do it either. <laughs> bye, bye, Spock. Bye, Spock. Bye, Spock. Bye, Spock. Bye, Spock. Bye, Spock.